When it comes to the great inventions and innovations of mankind, mapping probably doesn't come to the top of the list, but it definitely deserves more attention. Being able to accurately visually represent the world around us has undoubtedly been at the center of a lot of our successes as a species, from building ancient empires and exploring the globe to even surveying and mapping out the new world, maps have been there every step of the way. And really, we're living in an extraordinary time in human history because never before has so much geographical data been available to so many people. We have advanced data on soils and hydrology. We've been able to create extremely detailed representations of the Earth's terrain with lasers. We have GPS satellites that can tell us exactly where we are in the Earth's surface without using, you know, a cumbersome sextant or something. And of course, we have incredible access to images of the Earth's surface taken from space. This truly unprecedented rise in geographical information has given rise to an entire new field called geographic information systems. Now in the simplest terms, these are essentially mapping programs that can catalog spatial data and track how it changes over time. So for example, in forestry, we can tag a volume data and maybe harvest history to a specific acre of land. In shipping, you might be able to get information about port congestion and traffic. In mining, you might be able to get information about ore grades and soil types. Its usefulness to the world is really hard to overstate, but it all comes with a pretty large problem, and that is it's almost totally inaccessible to the average person. They're the exact opposite of user-friendly, and they're incredibly hard to learn. Even professionally, in industries where these are in common use, such as in forestry, very sm a very small percentage of people actually know how to use these programs to their full capabilities. In that sense, it's kind of similar to Microsoft Excel. Most people know how to do basic addition and averaging functions, but if you're really going to use it like a pro, it's basically a whole programming language. Unfortunately, even to use GIS systems for their most basic functions is pretty complicated and takes a lot of know-how. But most frustrating of all is that all the lower grade products on the market that generally people use for different types of, you know, we'll call them mapping purposes, are extremely limited. And it's extremely frustrating because very small changes would make them so much more capable and so much more useful that they would probably dominate the market pretty quickly, at least for, you know, low level users. So what I've really struggled to do is to find the easiest way for the everyday user to be able to map their properties and at least get some basic pseudo GIS functions for their own uses. And I think I found a way to do that. It involves using two pieces of simple and free software. The first being Google Earth and the second being Traclea. Now Google Earth is what we're going to use for our kind of primary mapping program per se. And then Traclea is what we're going to use as our in the field GPS. If you have a GPS yourself, you can also use that and I'll go over how to use that later. But all you're going to really need for this exercise is a computer and a cell phone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these two products to go out in the field and map my own property, come back and show you the process of putting it on the computer, processing, processing it, and then creating kind of usable track data from that. So stick around, follow me out to the field, and let's get to ma Now that we're out in the field, we can really go over what exactly our process is going to be. So I think in any situation, it's pretty useful to know your property boundaries. So that's the first thing we're gonna lay out. We wanna get a good geographical representation of the property we actually own. After that, it really depends on what exactly your individual objectives are. Of course, I come from the forestry perspective, so I'm more interested in anything related to tree harvesting and forest management activities. So namely, that's gonna mean uh, mapping out streams, maybe any sort of wildlife habitat, unique trees, um, steep areas that are disadvantageous for equipment, anything like that. But if you're watching this and you don't really have anything to do with forestry, and maybe you have uh, agricultural land, you might be more interested in mapping out individual features like apple trees, different types of pastures, rock walls and fencing. Um, really the sky's the limit. You can be as creative as you want. It really depends on what you need, but we'll be able to do anything. Now before we begin, let's go over the basics of the Traclea app, how to get it set up, and how to use it. Now it's going to start you out on a map called My Map, and what's important to remember is this is basically a project. Um, it's going to be a series of different tracks and waypoints uh, for a specific area, and you can have different maps. Um, so kind of keep everything organized as one project. If you want to change maps, you can go to My Maps list, and then uh, Create New Map down on the bottom. It's going to ask you for a name, and that's essentially your project folder. So we'll go back. So we'll go back to My Map. Now we can set up the basic settings that we're going to want to use. 
So one thing that's kind of annoying is it starts you out on metric, which if you're Canadian watching this, you don't really need to do anything. But for Americans, we'll go to settings. And for distance, it's gonna start you with metric, hit imperial, elevation, feet, speed miles per hour, coordinates are fine, unless you have preferences there. The other thing we're gonna to want to adjust is the GPS location refresh interval. So this is how many times the GPS takes a point while you're moving. Now it starts out as a default as 1.5. I think three seconds is good. You might find you want even longer. A lot of it depends on how fast you move, uh, how clean you want your lines, etc. cetera. Uh, the longer the duration, the neater your lines are gonna be on the map, but um, it might not be as accurate if you're making a lot of turns frequently. So that should pretty much do it for settings. Uh, you can kind of play around with it as you familiarize yourself with the app and honestly before you even go out in the field you should kind of play around with it and figure out what you want to do. Um, but let's get into the actual functionality now. So down here on the bottom there's an addition sign and you hit that and it's going to give you an option to add from file, record GPS tracks, create waypoint, or create track. Now it's important to understand exactly what these do. The record GPS track is going to be actually creating a track as you're walking. So it's going to be tracking your movement and creating a line based on that movement. Waypoint is just a singular point in a geographic location. And then tracks are basically lines that you are drawing on your map. And then it has some geographic information embedded in it, but it's not necessarily based on your position or movement. Let's, let's start out by making a waypoint. And what's important to remember here is it's, it's actually going to be creating the waypoint where your reticle is. So if we want to line it up to our GPS location first, before hitting a waypoint, we want to center that reticle. Create waypoint, and it's going to ask for a name and description. So for a name, we'll just hit point one, description, test, and we will save. And then it's going to create a waypoint at our location. And if I hit that waypoint, it's going to give me down here point one and then description below it, test. Now, I can create these off of my uh, location just by moving that reticle. So if I wanted to create another one right there, create waypoint, save, another one right where that reticle is. So that's pretty useful. Next up, we have track. And like I said, this is just a line. So I can add, 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 just like that. And uh, personally, I don't think that's terribly useful uh, unless maybe you have some imagery in the background here. So I would probably stay away from that unless you have a specific use for it. And then finally, we have the most important feature in my mind, which is record GPS tracks. Now up here, it's going to be giving you your accuracy, which is plus or minus 18 feet, altitude, speed. And to start recording, you might have to adjust your settings to make sure it has access to the GPS of your phone, but you just hit play. And then as you start walking, it's gonna be recording your tracks. Now, it's important to note that if this isn't showing up right here, it's not actually connecting to a GPS or it's not really working. The only problem I've had so far is sometimes you need to close out of the app completely and restart it, uh, and then it should start working again, but that's really, that only happened to me once. I don't, I'm not sure how common it is. This is a fairly new app to me. Okay, with all that said, we can get started. So right now I'm at the old ruins of a 150 year old rock wall that's on the boundary of my property. So I'm going to turn on my GPS tracks with the Tracklea app, and I'm going to simply follow the property line. Now, as we're walking the boundary, it's important to keep your eyes open for important features that you might want to come back to later. And uh, one of the most obvious examples of this is any sort of water feature that's entering into your property from the boundary. You're going to come across the beginning and end point of any sort of stream, and that's going to be a lot easier to connect the lines later on. So I'm gonna take a waypoint to note that this headwater is here. I'm still walking the boundary here, but uh, just kinda of had a thought that I wanted to share. I think one of the great benefits of doing this and mapping out your property is the extent to which you familiarize yourself with it. You can own a place for years and you know, have a lot of experience with it, but until you really map things out, and get an idea of where things are geographically and put that in perspective, you don't really know your land. And having the opportunity to walk it thoroughly and get a geographic, 
excuse me, geographic position for all those features really goes a long way. It's a worthwhile project for sure. That's all. All right, now we're on the other side of the property and we're downstream to where we marked out the headwaters earlier. So later when we're marking streams, we have the beginning point and the end point. Pretty simple. So I'm gonna take a waypoint here. All right, now we're almost done. I can see the road from here, but I came across another rock wall. Now, unlike the one we started at, this one goes from west to east and uh, it is not evidence of a property boundary, never has been. Um, so the question is, do we wanna map this out and make a mark or not? Well, it really depends. Uh, I'm a bit of a history buff. I love this old archeology, span um, century old archeology, span not very old, but uh, it's still very interesting to me. I like to kind of protect these areas, know where they are. And if you do a little research into the history, sometimes they can unveil some pretty cool stuff. So you can find some old aerial images and kind of see where the old boundaries of the fields were. Um, I, just, I just find value in it. So I'm gonna make a waypoint right here. If it was, it's not very long, it only goes up maybe, I don't know, 50 feet. If it was much longer, I'd probably make a track, but it's pretty much within the accuracy of the GPS, so not much of a point. All right, so that does it for the boundary, and let's take a look at what I got. So as you can see, that's kind of what it looks like, and that's uh, what the three second GPS interval looks like. So uh, it's a pretty clean line, in my opinion. Now up here in the uh, northwest corner, I did kind of make a little bit of an error as I was walking. I saw a flag from the north line, and I kind of jetted off, and then I got really confused for a second. So it uh, just goes to show you that sometimes lack of IQ points can be a hindrance, but don't let it stop you, because it never stopped me. So next up, I'm going to uh, map out my streams in much the same manner as the boundaries. And I'm gonna use those waypoints that I made along the way to kind of connect them and figure out how the water's flowing through the land. Now, a quick note of caution, um, hydrology is pretty interesting, and the vast majority of woodland streams are gonna be what we call intermittent streams. So they're only going to appear for a pretty short duration of the year, usually after rainstorms or in the spring when the snow is melting. So the best time to map streams really is in the springtime, but even then sometimes, you know, you can just get a lot of noise in your data and you can be mapping streams that don't really matter. They don't pertain to the management of your property. You really should just ignore them for the most part because it's just kind of excess drainage, not a real stream bed per se. Also, as is the case in this property, um, some older trails from older harvests were pretty poorly managed and over time they eroded and they kind of created new stream beds as a result of the rutting in the trails and the erosion that happened from poor water management BMPs. So the question is, what exactly do you want to manage as a stream and what don't you? And you know, states do actually have laws pertaining to this, so you know, familiarize yourself with the laws of your state. If you're in a forest management, again, if you just want to know your property, don't bother. Um, it's, it's up to you. But it is important to understand that there is a difference in the types of water flow on your property. And actually right here, I'm standing beside a perfect example of what I mean. This is actually an old rut from a skitter trail. And there's a little bit of water that's flowing in the trail. Now, am I going to manage this as a little stream? It might be helpful to know uh, where the wet areas are and you know try to prevent any sort of issues when I'm harvesting later on. But I'm not gonna manage this as an actual you know, stream habitat. Uh, that doesn't really make sense. Moreover, in a few hours, this probably won't even be running anymore because we got about two inches of rain last night, so we have more little streams than usual. So now I'm gonna be mapping out those streams as I see fit, um, using the same GPS tracking method as how I laid out the boundaries. And while I'm doing that, I'm also gonna be taking waypoints and keeping my eye out on the landscape to see if there's anything else of note to uh, put on the, on the map. And again, these are very large trees, wildlife habitat, dens, um, anything you might notice. In a lot of areas, apple trees are gonna be a really important feature to note. They're great for wildlife, and if you're into hunting, well, if you know, you know. So let's go ahead and do that, and then we can focus on any other points we need to gather. Let's see how much I can do, because we're kind of at that point in the year where I haven't quite adapted to how much shorter the days are, and it's getting dark pretty fast. Uh, so I might need to come back tomorrow morning and kind of finish up, but uh, I'm gonna to try to get as much as I possibly can done with uh, enough light to still film. So I just finished uh, following the stream up to the first point we marked on the boundary. And uh, what, what's interesting about it is it starts off as this beautiful natural brook channel and it comes down and eventually it kind of drains into an old skid trail, which makes me think that at some point 
Very unfortunately, a skitter just kind of went up the stream. So this was very poorly marked in a previous, uh, previous harvest, and they did a lot of damage to that stream channel and stream bed. But, you know, regardless, we have to kind of deal with what we have right now. And uh, the fact is that we have a new stream channel in an old skid trail. So I think a lot of people are quick to kind of dismiss um, man-made features as unnatural, but uh, that's the new environment, that's a new ecosystem, that's a new landscape, and we just kind of have to deal with it. So I'm gonna manage that as if it's this normal, natural stream channel. All right, guys, I just learned something about this app that I wanted to share. Uh, like I said, this is new to me too. Uh, so when you pause tracks, and then you resume them, it automatically links the two. So if you want to keep those separate, which, you know, we can fix all this in what I'll call post-processing later, but uh, if you want to avoid that messiness, hit save, uh, and then we'll just put stream as a name, and then resume a new set of tracks. And that way it will record separately. So not a huge deal, but just wanted to share that. All right, let's continue. So I did find something interesting. We have here what would be referred to as a legacy tree. It's a very large ash that was left over from a previous harvest. And this serves as sort of a biological historical landmark of this stand. So um, especially, honestly, this is too big for me to process. So unless I get larger machinery in here, I'm never gonna harvest it anyway. But uh, these are important for their ecological value, their wildlife value oftentimes, especially if it's a dead and rotten tree with a lot of cavities in it that can have a lot of unique value. Uh, so I'm going to make a, a waypoint to mark this. I know there are several of these trees throughout the property. I'm probably not going to find them all today. Uh, but it's important to kind of document where they are and you can kind of monitor them over the time and kind of see where they are. And this one's not very healthy. We do have uh, emerald ash borer in the area. This has not been hit yet. but. Um, the prognosis is not too good for him, for this tree and his kind. So uh, let's continue. So again, uh, we started off following the stream as kind of old skid trails, and it has kind of led us into a natural stream channel. So again, just very poor past management practices, and that's a real shame, but uh, can't really do anything about it now. We're all done with the streams now. I've marked out every substantial stream that I could find and I've connected the waypoints on both the west boundary and the east boundary, so I know uh, there's nothing else here. Now, I'm gonna kinda do a loop around the northern half of the property and look for any you know, notable land features or landmarks to put on the map, and uh, then we'll pretty much be done. There's one other thing I wanna check down by the road, but uh, let's check out the northern half first. Okay, well, I'm pretty much at the uh, northern boundary now, and I uh, haven't really found anything very notable, nothing map-worthy anyway. So uh, I'm gonna head back to the road, uh, get that last feature, and then we're going to head back. Okay, so we're pretty much back at the road, but there's one last point I wanted to grab. So kind of a common theme today has been ways in which previous management has altered the, uh, the landscape. And here's one example, and this goes way back. So this is a very old piece of land. Well, all, all land is old, right? But um, the use of this land is very old. In fact, uh, way back in the mid-19th century, this used to be the center of town before the railroad came through. It was an entire village, and now it's all grown over, it's all forested. Um, so we have here, actually, the old sunken in foundation of a home dating back to the mid-19th century. Uh, all I can tell you for certain is that there's a survey map from 1858, and this home is shown on that map. Uh, I don't know much about it beyond that. I'm hoping to do a little more digging in the future though. But uh, here's what I want to show you. So it's full of water now. Uh, we've gotten a lot of rain recently. But uh, what's important about this is after the snow melts in the spring, this is going to be completely full of water. And so it essentially has become what is known as a vernal pool, which is an important type of habitat for amphibians, uh, as they lay eggs, you know, um, different types of salamanders and newts, uh, even turtles, uh, fairy shrimp and stuff like that. There's a lot of ecological benefit to vernal pools. And so this point right here kind of serves a dual purpose. I was talking about how I'm a history buff myself. I want to kind of preserve this area 
as a monument to the history of the area. But also it now serves a dual ecological purpose of being a vernal pool. So the management of the land has been what it has been, the use of the land has been what it has been, and those scars or landmarks still exist. And they, the, the land has kind of adapted to it and uh, repurposed them in their own way. And so now this old home, this old structure that used to house a family is now habitat for reptiles and amphibians. Well, really amphibians. I'm not good at animals. Now let's go back to the house, upload this onto the computer, and turn it into a useful map with useful data. All right, so we're back at the camp now, and we can kind of do some post-processing of our lines on Google Earth. Now, what you're going to want to need is the desktop version of Google Earth Pro. You can get it for free. Now, Google Earth does actually have a web browser application that they really kind of try to push now. It's a lot more limited, and it's really just an aerial image viewer with some measurement tools. So you're really going to need the desktop version. Before we do anything, we're going to want to take our data and upload it onto the computer. So to do that, we're going to take these three little dots up here in the corner, and it's going to give us a bunch of options, and it's going to say export map to file. So we're going to do that, and it's going to give us a bunch of options for the file type. Now save it as camo. Once you hit that, it's going to ask for the location where you want to save it. Um, this is going to vary by device and personal preference. Uh, I would just save it to downloads or some easily uh, accessible folder. And then from there, uh, you can upload it to a cloud storage service. I usually email it to myself, to be honest. There is a benefit to using Google Drive. Uh, you can uh, airdrop it if you have Apple or use some other sort of Bluetooth tethering service. It's all up to you, but uh, you're going to want to export that as a KML first. And once you do that, it's going to disappear from your map, but you can easily load it back on, and uh, you can load on better data later. All right, so open up the desktop version once you get installed if you need to do that. And you're going to open up your KML file that uh, we made out in the field. Now, you, if you put it on, if you emailed it to yourself, download it. If you put it in a Google Drive, download it to a local drive and uh, find that directory. So we're going to go to File, Open, go to the directory. For me, it's just with downloads. That's kind of what it defaults to, I think. Uh, and we're going to open South Road. And it's going to take us right to our lines. Now, if you used a GPS device like a Garmin or something like that, what you're going to want to do is first hook that up to your computer via USB. And we can actually go to Tools right here, and there's an option for a GPS import. So choose your device and select what you want to import and simply hit Import. We're going to keep it the output as a KML, however. So as we can see here, uh, it's pretty decent, but it needs some work, and uh, we're going to make it pretty, and we're going to make it a little more clean. All right, so one thing to kind of keep in mind is the Google Earth, it's going to default to terrain on, and what that does is it kind of gives you a 3D model of the Earth's surface, and that's great for a lot of things, but uh, when you're trying to make lines and kind of create some distortions, it's kind of annoying, so I like to turn that off. So to start out, let's create the uh, property boundary. We're going to make that into a polygon. You can make it a line feature, but you lose some spatial data in doing so. So I'm going to make it a polygon, which is this button right up here, Add Polygon. Now, it's going to ask you for a name and a description. Now, the description is optional. For name, let's call this property boundary. Well, actually, the boundary is more of a line, isn't it? So let's just call it property. And then for description, we're going to leave that blank because, um, you know, I don't really think it needs one. But maybe for you, uh, you can have some sort of description. But if you have multiple properties, you can describe the specific property. You can have some data about uh, the property boundaries and maybe what color the markers are. Really anything you want. All right, so... Next, we're going to cover the symbology. It's going to default as just a solid white polygon. It's really annoying to work with, so you're going to want to change it to um, some other color. Now, for the outline, we're going to give it black lines. We're going to change the width to 2.0. And then for the area, you can have a fill and then kind of make it a little transparent if you want. Uh, maybe I'll do that later to kind of show you how that works. But um, we're just going to go with outlined for now. And we're going to keep up 
this kind of uh, prompt while we're making the polygon because if we hit OK, it's going to assume the polygon is finished. So as we're doing this, one thing to keep in mind is that the accuracy of your lines that you took on the ground are plus or minus 30 feet. And all the lines are are just individual points that are connected to each other. So the line's going to kind of go like this, and uh, there's going to be some anomalies, and that's fine. That's the reason we're doing this whole exercise to begin with. So you're going to be using both your lines and some um, visual clues from the aerial imagery to kind of do this. Now, in my case, I'm kind of lucky. My property was harvested last time in the late 90s, and then to the west of me, this property has, as far as I can tell, never really been harvested since probably the 19th century. So um, I can kind of use that difference in harvest history to better make my line. So I know the pin is down here right next to their camp, and that lines up with the harvest lines. So I'm going to follow my line up to this corner right here. Now, if you notice on my cursor, I kind of have like a gun reticle type thing with four dashes on a square. And this can really help you line up right angles. So I can look at that bottom part of the cursor and line that up with the edge of the property. And I can use the right side of the cursor to line it up with my easterly line right there. So I'm going to put that right there and do the same thing on this side, which is a little easier because those lines are closer. Boom, put that right there. And then finally, I'm going to connect this down by the road and do that. Now, if you don't like how the lines turned out, you can actually click and drag any of these lines and put them where you find they're better suited. So everything is easily fixable. Don't worry about it. But I'm going to double check here, and I think we can call that good. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that you can actually uh, get measurements from this once it's completed. So we can go to the measurements tab here, and we're going to hit acres, and we got 14.6 acres, which lines up with what I expect. So I'm going to hit OK to finish. And if you ever want to go back to edit any of these features, we're going to right click on the feature right here and go to properties. And we, we have the prompt up here. We can edit the points again. It's all good. All right, so now that the polygon's done, let's start with the streams. So instead of having a polygon, a stream is more of a line. Um, the data we derive from it is going to be more length oriented. We don't need to know the acreage or anything unless it was a pond. So we're going to hit the add path, which is right next to the add polygon. Add path, same kind of, kind of uh, situation. So we're going to name this stream one since we have three. For the description, again, it really depends on your purposes. I think maybe one interesting data point if you're really into uh, maybe hydrology and water science or if you have uh, fisheries and the larger streams on your property, then maybe you could have some data about the depth and width of the various streams, and that can give you some volume data. Also, if you need to install culverts or crossings, that can be useful data to have. Again, depends on your purposes. Sky's the limit. Be as creative as you want. Uh, in my situation, though, I'm going to leave that blank. I don't really need to know anything. Um, now, if, if I had a lot, if, a lot more acres here and uh, maybe you know, 20 different streams, yeah, I, I might do something like that because it might be useful to know, know how big those streams are. All right, so we'll go to Style and Color. And uh, we're going to change the color to blue, of course. I'm going to use that shade of blue. And the width, let's go 3.0 make them a little thicker, and we'll start tracing these lines. Now, one thing to remember as we're doing this is that, um, again, you know, the lines aren't, your lines aren't going to be totally accurate, but you can kind of use some clues from the aerial imagery to better line up uh, where those features are. So in this case, I can actually kind of see the gap in the canopy where the stream is, so I'm going to use that to better align this stream bed. So I'm going to connect to that line right there, and kind of cross, oops, maybe not that one too low, cross through and connect it to the end there and hit OK. Next up, uh, we're going to do another stream. 
Now, something else to keep in mind too is uh, you can see that you have the option to add web image or local image. You can actually take pictures of these features and then uh, store it in these files. And that can be uh, pretty, pretty useful for some things, especially for different features like the rock wall or the legacy trees, uh, different types of wildlife habitat. So it's up to you. Um, again, sky's the limit. All right, so we have the streams in and we have the boundary of the property. And now just to kind of keep my workplace clean, so to speak, uh, I'm going to kind of clean up the features that I've already delineated and digitized. So over here we have all the different features from the KML file. And I know the northwest corner is done. Real point, that was the uh, northwest corner. And I know all the streams are done. The property boundary is done. And now we just are left with some of the waypoints that we made. Now all I really need are I mean, a lot of these were made just to, for helpful references while I'm doing this, kind of like this, the stream one endpoints and whatnot. Um, so the only waypoints that I really need in perpetuity are going to be the ash legacy tree that I found, the rock wall on the east, and then the foundation down here. So I'm going to turn everything off but those. And we're left with that. All right, now we don't actually need to recreate these features. Uh, a waypoint is just a waypoint. So what we're going to do is just kind of symbolize them and uh, move them to our working folder. So we'll start with the house, again, edit with properties. Um, now this, especially with this feature in the rock wall, uh, situation where you might want to add an image. I didn't do that though. I'm going to keep it named house, but as a description, I'm going to put, I'm going to put um, 1850s, Foundation and well and uh, vernal pool habitat. And then up here, we can change the icon. I think the little house icon is fitting in this situation. So we'll call that good. Next, let's go to the rock wall. Rock wall properties. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to maybe put directional data in here. East to west. And there's really no good uh, symbol for this. So I'm just going to make it a little diamond. This way I know where it is. And then finally the ash tree, which can you guess what I'm going to use for symbol there? You guessed it. Tree. But I'll put in legacy tree, um, maybe, you know, any other sort of attributes, uh, cavity tree, uh, maybe for uh, something like that. I don't know. So we're going to call that good. <clears throat> and what we have here is essentially a working map of my property. Now, you can always add to this. Um, it, it can be something that's an ongoing project. Uh, but let me show you kind of how you can make some adjustments here. Let's go back to my property boundary, which is going to the polygon. And let's just kind of change the style and color. So area, we have it outlined. Let's fill it. And like I said, it's kind of an ugly white color. But let's make it this kind of light green. And then give it, I don't know, 50% transparency. So you can do this. Um, and this, you know, this style can be useful for various things. Uh, especially if you have multiple properties kind of in the same area. It's a better way to visualize it. You can kind of play around with it. There's a lot you can do, but I'm going to leave it blank for now. All right, so now for whatever reason, it actually, it usually just defaults to temporary places. In this situation, a lot of the things I made is uh, under my places, but if it's left under temporary places, if you close out of Google Earth um, and then you open it back up, it's not going to be there. And it'll probably give you a warning before you do that. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move everything into my places to make it permanent but I'm going to create a separate folder. So I'm going to create a folder and I'm going to call this property. And we're going to move all, oops, all of our features under that folder, including these ones. Oops. 
long does it take me to do this? There we go. All right. And so that way, uh, if you want to turn the entire thing off, it's just all right there. Uh, it's well, it's nice and organized. Organization is an important part of any sort of map work like this. And uh, now we can kind of get rid of this and never have to worry about it again. So what's important to understand here is that uh, this is all still like a KML file. You can actually take these new lines and re-upload them into Tracklia. If you take these, this KML file um, or files and you put it into your Google Drive, then you can actually go out in the field and use the mobile Google Earth app and you can open up these lines on your Google Earth app. Now, like I said, every mapping program has these kind of really annoying downsides to them. And one of the downsides of Google Earth, it does have a GPS functionality. It will show you your physical location. You can't take any tracks with it. You can't make any features or take any waypoints. I don't know why they don't add that. It would make it so much more useful if they just kind of combine the Tracklia um, functionality on the Google Earth app, they'd be unstoppable. Uh, but they don't, and you kind of have to work with what we have. So anyway, it is useful to know um, that you can re-upload this data onto your various devices and then use it out in the field. But this is kind of your working program and any sort of edits you want to make to it is going to be on the Google Earth desktop. So yeah, that's the process. There you have it. Um, like I said, it's, it's really a great exercise, and if you have, especially if you have forest land, I highly recommend that you give this a shot and really try to map out your property. The amount you'll learn about your property, even if you've had it for a long time, really kind of thoroughly digging through and looking for these things and um, putting them in a geographically referenced area on the computer, um, it's a really great exercise. So hopefully this can kind of help you in that endeavor. So if you guys found that useful, I'd really appreciate if you liked and subscribed. And uh, next, we're going to be kind of talking about forest stand typing and how you can map out the various attributes of the forest itself. So if that interests you, you know, stay tuned. Um, but until next time, see you later.